All with who is the author of Dancing in Red Shoes Will Kill You, published by Anana Publication. Hi, Donna. Hi, Julia. So we have a few questions, and we're going to go through them in an interview format, and hopefully everyone reading this will enjoy it. So, um, first, Donna, can you summarize the events of December 6, 1989, that's, that inspired this novel, for those who don't know about them? So on December 6, 1989, in Montreal, a 25-year-old man who grew up in Montreal entered uh, Ecole Polytechnique, is the engineering school associated with the um, University of Montreal. And he had been there about seven times before. Um, and, and I say that because he, his intention was very clear, and he had sort of done a practice run, if you will. So what he did was he entered a first classroom asked about 60 uh, men to leave the classroom, including the professors. And they did. And when they did, he uh, shot the women. He then left and went down to the cafeteria and targeted and shot women, and then went to a final classroom uh, and killed, again, killed women, and then killed himself. So ultimately, he killed 14 women. And his intention, as evidenced by his uh, suicide note, was to kill women. Kill feminist is what he called them. So why did you choose to write this story that, that is based on true events as fiction? I'll tell you, that took enormous soul searching. And, um, and actually, over the course of a few years, I was back and forth. I initially planned to be nonfiction. And uh, it, you know, in terms of the research, years of research, lots of personal interviews and so on, you know, archival research. And I really thought, yes, it's going to be nonfiction. But then I think the, the, what put me into the fiction zone was, um, though I had been thinking about it, I think what kind of put me over the edge, if you will, and to, uh, to make that decision firm, was I listened to an NPR interview with Slavenka Drakulic, who's a Croatian um, writer. She had done interviews, extensive interviews, with uh, victims from the Balkan War, the Serbian rape camps in that war. And her intention was to write a nonfiction account, like a documentary kind of account. But after she had done all of the interviews, she she found that the way uh, she wanted, the way she felt she could best get across that interior life, that really emotional, uh, psychological impact of what those women went through, was to write a novel and do some kind of some kind of composite characterization. And I listened to her, and I listened to her, and I thought that's really what I want to get at. I want to write a book about this experience, but I want to tell the story of the women. I'm not interested in the killer. Um, I teach a course on school shootings, and I'm really, it seems perhaps crazy, but I'm not that interested in mass murderers so much as I'm very much interested in the impact that these kinds of violent, hyper-masculine uh, uh, activities, if you will, these, these horrendous behaviors have on real people. And so um, I felt I was best able to do that by fictionalizing. Interesting. Thank you. So in the book, one of the main characters, Deirdre, is a student at a Kingston University. It's called Aquitaine. Obviously, it's Queen's University. Um, and she's learning about feminism and consent. And there is a nasty campus war going on between feminists who are demanding safety from rape and violence. And there are men who oppose their message. How are the events at Aquitaine in the book connected to the massacre at Cantec, which is your pseudonym for Ecole Polytechnique? You know, I didn't know that there was any sort of connection. I didn't even know, in fact, about the No Means No campaign until I was well into my research and, you know, spent quite a bit of time up in Canada. And I, somewhere within the research, I read about this No Means No campaign that happened just two months before the uh, Montreal massacre. And so, I dug a little deeper, went to Kingston several times, met with, um, met with, uh, you know, for example, a professor who was teaching at the time, and then um, did some phone interviews with some women who were actually involved in that no means no campaign and taking over the president's office and so on. And um, they were very much interested in having that story told, uh, and sent me documentation, original documentation from 1989, like the list of demands they gave the president and so on. And so. As I was hearing that story and knowing I was writing about the Montreal Massacre that happened two months later, and then at that point knowing I was writing fiction, 
I really started to conceive of this entire project as um, a, a way to address for the more general public the spectrum of misogyny. And I didn't, you know, I thought I cannot give some sort of lecture on the spectrum of misogyny because that's not going to appeal to, um, you know, certainly not going to appeal to a general readership. It's, it's a far more, I don't even know if academics is the term for it, but it, it's not the kind of thing that's going to get at people's souls and hearts and minds. So, and nevertheless, that's clearly what I saw was that this is a spectrum of misogyny happening. And so I think what, what finally clinched it for me in terms of making sure that I had that plot line in there about the no means no was that when I talked to some of the women who had been there, they clearly emphasized that the women from um, Aquitaine felt guilty mm -hmm. that this that perhaps what if this killer who hated feminists had somehow uh, seen them on TV because the CBC was was very prominent on the campus at the time. It got a lot of uh, national attention. And they thought, what if our activism, which we did because we felt it was making our women safe, what if that angered him? Could we somehow be culpable? Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, is um, sadly the way women often feel. Yeah. And so I really then thought, no, this has to be part of the book so that we can see how much how much guilt women take on about these things when in fact that they bore to my mind they bore no guilt. Yeah. That was kind of a long answer to a short question. Sorry, Julia. That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> so you you mentioned that um, you're not we so we we had this conversation also prior to recording that you're you're not interested in mass murder so much as you are the the effects of them, um, and that. That's part of the research that you do and, and what you teach. So was it a conscious choice in this novel not to name the killer? Um, because people, many, many, especially feminist activists who memorialize the Montreal Massacre, deliberately don't name him. They name the women who were killed, but they don't name him. Was that a conscious choice for you as well? Yes. And in early iterations of this book, um, and especially when I was going to write this as nonfiction, I had this device wherein I had footnotes um, all the way throughout the manuscript, and the footnotes told the story of this killer. Um, you know, so for example, uh, when he purchased his, purchased his gun, when he got his uh, permit, um, things about his family background, all the things that all Canadians know now. Um, and I thought, well, that will be an interesting way to do this. I'll tell the story of the women, but I will sublimate, literally, physically sublimate his story to the to the footnotes, and. I thought I was I thought I was pretty clever. I thought that's that's kind of unique. I, you know, I think people would like to know. And then as I was really finishing the book, there came a day that it all became clear to me that that all had to go. And this was before it was published. Um, well, obviously, uh, but before I was well into that process. And I just thought, no, no, that's not the story I want to tell. And um, all the footnotes went away, and it was an enormous amount of work. And I think it served a purpose because it clarified for me that I didn't want to muck up, if you will, the story of the incredible pain that these, the women, the survivors, their families, their moms, their dads, their, their boyfriends, what they went through was what I wanted to honor and emphasize. And details about when the killer got the gun and, you know, how his father beat him, I thought, nope, I'm not going to do that. Other people have talked about that. So very conscious decision not to name him, yes. That makes sense. It's, it's unfortunate. I, I know his name, um, and I don't know all the names of the women, and I, I need to work on that, too. Yeah. Um, so what lessons do you think we can continue to take from the events of December 6th? What do you think has changed um, in Canada, although you're an American, you, you've done some research here, and, and in the world, and what hasn't? Oh, goodness, yeah. I made some notes uh, thinking about this very thing. Um, well, of course, in Canada there was the um, the gun registry that seemed to uh, uh, be a way to heal, I think, some of this, and then that that went away. Um, so that's deeply concerning, and, and and we should take a lesson from Canada because we we don't even go anywhere near that far, and we had a you know our most one of our most horrific shootings within the last few years was our children, as you know, in Connecticut. Um, and we don't, 
we so far have not been able to make any headway um, in terms of guns. Um, but I think, I think what we can do is we can teach and we can talk, which is what I try to do all the time. Um, you know, what happens when you talk about feminist issues often is that you'll get eye rolling or you will get, this is from people who are not um, particular fans, you'll get laughing, you'll get uh, as if it's a joke or like a little hobby. And so I'm often trying to train my students, and certainly myself, to counter that. But counter it, I try as often as I can not to counter it with rage, though I might very clearly be feeling rage. I try to counter it with a voice that can be heard if that makes sense. Because I think a lot of times, you know, you think about the guys who were calling in after the Montreal massacre, supporting the killer and so on. Um, to argue back with them in, in, and express that rage is not productive, even though we, we are right, I would argue, with feeling it. So I try to be as compassionate and loving as I can. Um, and I, I think that uh, I try to teach my students that. But at, but at the same time, to continuously resist so one of my favorite lines um, when someone will express something anti-feminist, anti-female, is to say, that's not my experience. Would you like to hear my experience? And that's been helpful to my students because sometimes we don't resist because we don't have language for it. So I think we have to practice that. So I had something really interesting happen at a recent reading in Lenox, Massachusetts, which is near my hometown. And it was, it was a, a small, adorable little bookstore, but it was quite packed. And up near the front was a little man. Um, uh, I'd say he was maybe 75, 80, and his wife. And he had a lot of questions. And um, w among his questions was, have you ever felt in danger or in fear because you're a woman? And so I, I tried to clarify, I said, do you mean because I've written this book, am I, am I concerned about my safety? And he said, no. As a female, have you ever felt danger or fear? And I was really struck by that question because I thought it was a big duh. Mm -hmm. And he clearly was, he was, he was being, he was genuinely asking this question. There was no tone, there was no attitude. And so I said, the crowd was mostly female, and I said, could I ask this question, sir, to the audience? And he said yes. And so I said to the women, could I have a show of hands of any of you who have felt in danger or fearful because you're female? Mm -hmm. Almost every hand went up. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> Julia. Exactly. And so I said, sir, would you mind turning around and just having a look? And he did, and he was very quiet. And I wasn't, my intention was not at all to shame him or, or make him feel bad. But just to see, I, that's when I say talk and teach. I believe people don't know about this because they don't either don't listen. It's not that feminists haven't been talking about this forever, but they don't listen or they think it's a joke or they don't want to believe it. Mm -hmm. So we have to just keep talking about it and talking about it. And, and we need to, this is a very important thing to me, we need to educate our boys. Um, we need to teach them not, that it's not, that, that the only way to be a boy, to be a man, to be masculine is in a little box of rage and mm -hmm. toughness. And um, I teach this to, in my school shooting class. I have uh, first year students. And um, when I first teach this by way of a, a scholar named Jackson Katz and his videos called uh, Tough Guys, they resist it intensely. Mm -hmm. Until I tell them, I think boys are done a disservice. I have to approach it this way. Boys and men are done a disservice because they're only allowed to be uh, so limited in their emotions. And I think if we can, and this may be a cop-out, I'm not sure, but if we can approach it that way and say, why can't we all be fully human mm -hmm. and and cry and laugh and be vulnerable and so on? And um, I try to teach this. I, you know, I have a son. I have two daughters and a son, and I hope I've done that with my own child to allow him to be fully human and not have to stuff his feelings and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a real key to what, what we can do. Um, and there are feminists, there are feminists in Canada, there are feminists in the United States and all over the world. Um, Jody Williams, uh, who is a Nobel Prize winner, who wrote a, a blurb for my book, um, 
is kicking butt out there. She, she and her, um, the Nobel Women's Initiative, they are all over the world talking about rape as a weapon of war and so on. Uh, Malala Yousafzai, oh my gosh, we are, um, we are a world that is, uh, I was going to say waking up. I don't know that that's what I want to say. We're talking. Mm-hmm. We're talking. We need to keep talking and not let this go and not say, well, this thing happened, you know, 25, 27 years ago. No, I have a list of the exact same thing that happened just two years ago, a year ago. Yeah. So talking, talking, talking. But also marrying that with compassion, which I think is the hardest thing, especially as a second wave feminist brought up with uh, Ms. Magazine and, and Gloria Steinem and being so frustrated sometimes, just so frustrated that we can't be seen as fully human. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have to meditate every day so that I can be compassionate so that I can then be effective, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. It does. There's that, there's an that was a very long answer. <laughs> no problem. There's an organization uh, that, that's based in Canada, but I think is international now, called the White Ribbon Project, which is also yes. um, a, a, an organization for men by men to, to help them navigate through the world of masculinity and what, what it can mean and anti-violence. It's great. It is great. I talked um, a couple of years ago. I was doing an article for Ms. on the Isla Vista shooting and um, talked at length with Todd Minerson, uh, you know, by telephone. And uh, I admire that organization greatly. And he was he was um, vastly helpful to me. And so I'm a big proponent of that. And and this is what I call on my young men in my classes to um, to step up and resist when you see one of your guy friends doing something that is you know hurtful to women or making fun. Just step up and say, knock it off. Yeah, you don't know, be like that. Don't have to fight about it. Just say, that's not cool. Cut it out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so to, to wrap up, I want to ask you a little bit about the process of getting published, since we discussed this a little before we started recording. Um, so you're you're an American. How did you end up publishing with Inanna Publications in Toronto? Yeah. You know, um, getting published is so, uh, is so challenging. You send out, you know, in my case, 50. 100 query letters to agents, to publishers, and so on. But one of the first uh, publishers I sent to was Inanna because I had seen a quote that said something like, um, smart, bo- smart books for people who want to read about real women's lives. I know I don't have that exactly accurate, but I thought, that I, I want to talk about real women's lives. So I think maybe they'd be interested in my book. And, you know, I sent it off and... Um, it was 13 months later that I got an email saying, yes, we'll look at the manuscript. Because with the query letters, they are not necessarily willing to look at your, you're just asking them to consider you. Right. And so I sent it off, and then it was about five or six months later that I got the email saying, yes, we want this. So meanwhile, I was sending off, you know, query letters and, you know, emails and so on. But um, I was delighted because this is a publisher I admire greatly. I had read a number of the books published by them so I could get a feel for it actually talked to some of the authors before and to see. And then, of course, when I launched, I was launching with um, a few other women, so I got to know them and hang out a bit. And um, Luciana, who is the um, editor-publisher there, Luciana Ricatelli, is, oh, my gosh, top-notch. I admire her so much. She just walked me through a process and and challenged me to think about uh, some of the ways I was saying things. And we, we went back and forth and had conversations about, what would be most effective and it was the most stimulating soul filling work um, to have someone who who got the book and got what I was trying to do what was helping me to make it better I cannot express my gratitude for that it was wonderful That's great I'm a very fortunate woman to to have uh, partnered with them I'm so happy that's wonderful okay well thank you so much for talking to me today